So branding was really at the st very start of trade, really. Uh, so you had that signifies where it comes from, and this signifies what it means, and the salesperson in them, in the trader, would tell the story. A, a, a brand is about reputation, a brand is about what people say about you, it's not about what the company thinks it's telling you. It's actually if other people around you say, that brand is good, try it. In a way, I've, I've had, you know, it's been a roller coaster. Some things I've chosen to do have been successful, some have been failure, but you learn from the failures as well. To find your true ikigai, you've got to kind of, you know, what are you good at? So imagine a Venn diagram, that's the Venn in the middle. What are you good at? You know, what do you love? Uh, what's the world need? And what can you be rewarded for? If you get all those in harmony, that's your ikigai in the middle. And that should be your personal brand purpose. Jeff Bezos, who knows a few things about branding, <laughs> yeah. he's the one who said, you know, a, a brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And of course, what he's saying is it's true. Brand is about reputation. It's not about what you tell them. It's about what they say about you. I believe everyone has a story to tell. Through seeking true, authentic insights about the entrepreneurial journey, I provide a platform for our peers to share their stories and inspire those that listen. This is the County Business Talks podcast, produced by H2 Productions. Okay, welcome to another episode of the County Business Talks podcast. My guest this week is a branding expert with over four decades of experience within the creative industry, working with some of the biggest global brands on the planet. He is also a visiting lecturer at a number of art colleges and universities. Today, we're gonna to talk about all things branding and his journey. I'm delighted to welcome Brand Dad himself. I am Walsgrove. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to be here, Sam. I've uh, heard a lot of your podcasts and I love the way that you've got empathy, so just be kind to me today. Mate, how could I not be? Brand Dad himself. <laughs> love that name, mate, I love that name. I know we've spoken about it a few times, I can't, mate. Go do on. you wanna know where it comes from? I do. Well, you know we're recording here at Plus X. Yes. It came from some of the young people I've been mentoring here. I was in the cafe downstairs, and a couple of them went, hey, we've got a name for you. And I went, Leonardo, George. <laughs> and I went, Brandad. And I thought, I don't know whether to be insulted or to laugh. <laughs> so I laughed, and then I was walking to the car park, got my phone out, went, brandad.co.uk, 15 quid, bang. Brilliant. <laughs> love that. I love that. And it's so memorable. I remember. I still remember the first time I obviously yeah. met you. It was at the B BBC yeah. Breakfast Club, yeah. and um, and I remember you come out. You give me a card. And I was like, hey, he's absolutely gold. You will never forget it. And I'm sure many well, people. Don't. It says what it does on the tin, doesn't it? Really. I love that. And, uh, <laughs> what, and what a perfect conversation to have then about exactly. About branding. But, look, exactly. Mate, we're gonna we're gonna start. Just, just start your story. Just tell me a little bit about yeah. life growing up. Something about maybe your early years that sort of shaped who you are today. And I guess we're, we're yeah. Gonna, love of branding first, first yeah. come from? It's a great question. I mean, you know, in, in a way, I, I feel very lucky. It, you know, I had two very loving parents. They met at Oxford during the war. Mm. And I'm talking about the Second World War. This is how brand that I am. <laughs> yeah. uh, they met at Oxford, and uh, he was a scientist, and she was uh, studying English and the arts. And they brought us up to, to really love books and stuff. But I was the youngest of four. Mm. And my father was a scientist, whereas my mother was a very good painter. And I think she said... To, you know, to herself, she said, the dad can have the first three, the last one's mine. <laughs> so she encouraged me to paint and draw and stuff. And also, uh, I kind of loved the sort of comic strips in the newspapers. And so I started getting comics as well and started copying comics. So at a very young age, I was being encouraged to draw, mm -hmm. but also just loving comic books, and you know, a love of DC comics and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. So it kind of encouraged my, my art side. And then my mother, who created me both, you know, nature but also nurtured my creativity she definitely you know i used to love watching her paint and it was a kind of you know the creative process was just fantastic yeah oh, i love that i love that and then what so uh, like, obviously that, that whole creative side and doing that mm. growing up was was that always i just want to get into that side of it was that was that always your goal? I'm gonna no it. it's because i went to a kind of old-fashioned grammar school which in fact my brother went to my father had been to weirdly i was taught by the same French teacher as my father, which was bizarre. But uh, so this old fashioned grammar school, and they encourage you to be academic. And uh, I loved history, I still love history. I talk about the history of branding mm, as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was kind of 50 50 between going to university to do history or go to art college. And then my dad was a natural marketeer. He said, But don't go to art school, it's full of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I thought, Dad, you're a natural marketeer, I'm going to art school. <laughs> 
I love that. I love that. And, and then, obviously, you obviously you went to art school and studied. So, yeah. and then coming out of that was that. Well, I just want to get into yeah. marketing branding. Well, I can You know, I think it's it's funny. I'm I'm you know teaching now, or visiting lecture at some places, and it's it's a struggle. I think for a lot of graphic designers to think. You know, what do I do with my graphic design when I've done it? And of course, I always thought I wanted to go and work in advertising. Mm. For me, that seemed to be, you know, the place where you could have fun, make money and stuff. And when I graduated out of, um, I was at the LCP, which is now the London College of Communication, mm. a, a great college, had some great lecturers there. Um, I, I'd had a placement in an ad agency and I just hated it. And I thought, oh my God, I've done three years study and I'm now in a job that I just don't want to do at all. And somebody said, why don't you just go work for a design company and do sort of packaging and, and D design brand identities and stuff like that. I said, all right, I'll give it a go. And the first week I, at this company I joined, I loved it. We yeah. were just creating new brands. Wow. And it was just, you know, the whole creative process, using design and using imagination and using storytelling yeah. was fantastic. And uh, uh, there's a story to tell here because the first brand I worked on was we had these boxes of tortilla chips and crisps and nuts and everything, and they wanted to come up with a brand. And the idea came up that these are these are foods from around the world, so we called it Phileas Fogg. It was the launch of the Phileas Fogg snack brand, one of the very first things I worked on. And I just thought, I love it. We're creating something out of nothing, and yeah. people just felt, you know, it was very successful at the time, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. I'm, I'm I'm obviously a fan of that, that creative. I've spoke to different people within that within the industry and stuff like that and it's fascinating like, because it's the bloodline I guess of a, a couple of things I really think yeah. make a business thing is obviously your brand and the brand identity is key yeah. isn't it because yeah. that's a, obviously the story how you, how you yeah. tell that and then you know, I always talk about culture because actually growing a business and stuff like that the culture yeah. but actually at the starting point of any any bit is getting that story right and getting that brand identity yeah. is so good. Well I think that's what I liked about it. It was a combination of of, of, of visual identity and verbal identity. Mm -hmm. And because I was also a sort of writer again encouraged by my mother mm -hmm. and uh, so you know I, did, used to, I still do a lot of copywriting now is it's the two things, it's the visual and verbal together. And if you go back into the history of brands, which we'll touch on a bit later, yeah. it's really the meshing of those two that makes more successful brands is when because you know, you know, I've worked with lots of companies, and they go, you know, a brand is just a logo, and you kind of go, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, uh, how can I tell you? It's so much more than that, yeah. which people begin to realise now. Yeah, no, I'm sure, I'm sure. I mean, well, let, 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 let's get, delve into that a little bit. I'd like to know, like, give maybe a little bit of an overview to the listeners about about the history of branding yeah. and stuff, and where we sort of began when people first started looking yeah. at that. Well, it's kind of it's really interesting. We'll go on to some books later, which I'm going to refer to, but uh, uh, which I know previous um, uh, speakers here have talked mm -hmm. about. But when you look into the history of branding, uh, it's obviously it, you know it's a bit like it's a fake thing. It's mm -hmm. made up, like lots of things are made up, but it's kind of made up for a good reason. So, if you think about the cognitive revolution, what seventy thousand years ago, when people started telling stories, mm -hmm. so storytelling happened long before making marks. But when people started making pots and ceramics and things like that, they used to put their signature on the bottom or a stamp to make, make sure it was theirs. And mm -hmm. of course, once in international trade started growing, especially around the Mediterranean, yeah, yeah. you know, pots were coming in from China, pots were going from Greece. So artifacts started to have the mark or the signature. So, and of course, what that was supposed to be saying is, look, I've made this with pride. You know, it's got provenance, it comes from somewhere, it's made with the best materials. Mm. So already that mark was beginning to have something, have some meaning. And of course, the trader, being a good salesman, would say, this is the best pot, this is why it's worth this much, because it's made by X. Yeah, yeah. So the branding process really started as a way of um, pride in your workmanship wow. and, and creating marks. And of course, when you think about hallmarks in, um, in jewellery, that's exactly what that is. It's showing a provenance. Yeah. So branding was really at the st very start of trade, really. Uh, so you had that signifies where it comes from and this signifies what it means and the salesperson in them in the trader would tell the story mm -hmm. and you know it's why if you went to an antiques roadshow now they go oh, yes this is a Ming vase from you know the, and they'll, <laughs> yeah. they'll put a value on it and all the people behind go Ooh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's been branded you see it's been, so it's got a provenance you know the history of it yeah even like you say, that down to ju literally just being a signature of someone, but it is a absolutely. And the word brand is an even more fascinating story. It's an old Norse term, so the, the term comes from a thing called branda, B-A-R-N-D-R, 
which means to mark your animal, your, your livestock, with, a, with a, a, a burning stick, you know, put across mm -hmm. it or whatever. So literally, it was putting a mark in something. And of course, this really developed in, in 19th century America, when people, you know, the herds on the plains of America, people, you know, they were all roaming free, so you had to brand their ass with a mark to, to yeah. say that it's yours. Yeah. So branding comes literally from burning a logo on somebody's bum. No, <laughs> 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 and him, what, um, I, I get, how, how have you seen? Like, well, let me edit it, I don't think no, so. No, no, <laughs> well, mate, we'll leave that one in. We'll leave that one in. But what, talk to me a little bit about, I guess, look, you, you, you've been in, you know, Brand and creative, uh, creative industry for many, many years. How, how have you seen it change? I guess over the years yeah, I mean, up to where we are. We talked a little bit offline. Yeah, around and there, maybe things have changed a little bit. But what, well, tell me that. It's a great question because the real revolution. Sort of, if you think about it, the 19th century, is when really capitalism took hold mm. and things were being traded around the world, and that's where packaged goods. You know, in the in before things were packaged up, mm. they were sold loose stock. In fact, some of the shops now in Seven Dials are going back to doing that no packaging thing. So, yeah. it's an irony, but we'll come yeah. on for that another yeah, time. Yeah. But this idea of packaged goods was really the, the sort of 19th century thing of products going around the world. So you had you know jars of coffee, you had tins of of beans, you had all sorts of things. Start, that's where branding really kind of came into its own, and that's really the kind of growth of consumer branding. Mm. Um, and what accelerated with that was obviously improvements in printing, improvements in packaging technology, all sorts of things. So lots of brands were about the brand in the hand. Um, what really changed in the 20th century is, is then uh, more and more businesses thought, well, it's a good idea to signify who we are. So businesses began to brand themselves, create their own corporate identities and things. And then if you think post-war, well, the Second World War, um, then services started to brand themselves. So if, if you like, the first generation of branding was like a jar of coffee, the second gener generation of branding was more like going to a Starbucks. It's the experience. Mm -hmm. So you brand the experience. It's about with friends having a coffee. It's not about where does that coffee come from. So branding started with products, really, and moved into services. And to answer your question, it's going around in the circle. Mm -hmm. What we moved into, particularly with the growth of the internet and computer-aided design, is much more uh, a brand is about reputation, a brand is about what people say about you. It's not about what the company thinks it's telling you. It's actually if other people around you say that brand is good, try it. Mm -hmm. You actually believe your uh, peers more than you actually believe. People become cynical about marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, this generation, the younger generation, know exactly when they're being marketing to, and they, d they don't like it. Mm -hmm. So they like recommendations. That's why you've got sort of peer recommendations and you've got reputation management and all sorts of things. So branding's changed with technologies, and also it's changed with, with as people become more wary. But if you think about it, a lot of brands were hugely su successful in the 60s because of TV advertising. Yeah. Whereas TV advertising doesn't have the same hold anymore. It's actually much more about um, social media platforms. So technologies change branding all the time, and we'll talk about it a bit later, but playing with AI design is just yeah. blowing my mind at the moment. Yeah, uh, we're definitely uh, we we'll definitely come on to to AI because that is that is fascinating. But I guess it's it's really interesting that you say about that. And I, for, for me, like you look at something from a branding point of view, and some people may go their brand, like you said earlier, is oh that's our logo. Well, yeah. no, it's more than that. And some people might go actually that's our values then, and that's what we stand yeah. for, etc. Yeah. And you you know you can chuck them on the wall and you know or on your website, and you go oh you know these are our core yeah. values. This is what we stick to. And, um, but actually listening to you talk there and I guess you're right it's not anything really to do with that it encapsulates it but it's actually what speaks to people on how you yeah. the emotions and how you make that person feel from what when they look at that brand. yeah and also you, you need to be, you need to get into their vernacular you know think of some of the most successful brands they become verbs you know mm. think how irritated James Dyson is that people are Hoover with a Dyson you yeah. know because Hoover's become, and people Google search you know so the successful brands become part of the vernacular yeah. uh, elastoplast and post-it notes they've all become part of they're beyond the brand they're actually describing the object so yeah. it's it's really interesting that um, uh, successful brands just get tied into actually language yeah sure sure that's interesting and then, well, look, talk to me a little bit about obviously you've worked with a lot of large agencies or you run your own yep. agency as well I mean 
t- talk to me about some. I mean, we, um, w- when I first met you, we had a coffee. You talked to me about some of the uh, yeah. exciting brands that you would worked yeah. with over the years. Talk, talk to me about some of them and any that really sort of stand out. Well, it's very, very lucky. I, I mean, I, I think I've, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know. You kind of make your own luck, or it's serendipity. But um, after I went to the small agency that did Phileas Fogg, I then went to work for a, uh, an agency that was growing fairly quickly called Coley Porter Bell, who are now part of Martin Sorrell's WPP group. But then they were just an independent company, and we were doing lots of new product development. And you know, I used to sort of love it when I come back and and. My son, who who's should know better and is in his 30s, still remembers the fact my dad worked on creating McCoy's crisps or <coughs> hobnob biscuits or things like that. Wow. Uh, whereas I think probably my favorite story is one I tell the people here at Plus X and they go, OK, well, we'd love you to help on the brand. Uh, is there anything famous you've worked on? I go, just look next door. And they go, what do you mean? I say, see that big square orange sign? They went, yeah, B&Q. I did that 25 years ago. And I tell them the story of Mr. Block and Mr. Quayle, who had their, you know, hardware shop in Southampton. And, of course, the brand wasn't, you couldn't call it. So they used to research with white van men and say, you know, what do you think of Block and Quayle? They went, what, the old B&Q? Pop down in the morning, pick me plasterboard up. That's a B&Q, isn't it? And so, wow. so it went back to them. It said, your brand is B&Q. It's not Block and Quayle. I love that. I love that. That was done before my time, but I created the identity for B&Q because B&Q then moved into the Far East, into China and Taiwan and things. But it was, I mean, I love the fact that, you know, and B&Q, really clever brand. They didn't do a URL of bnq.com. Their URL is DIY.com because they know that people were searching for DIY. They're not searching for by brand name. So I think one of the pieces of advice I'm giving to brands even now is don't think that your brand name has to be URL. Try and think what you might be searched for. So there's a kind of, what's interesting there is branding is changing as how people try and find brands or relate to brands is changing. I guess that, yeah, look, the internet itself must have changed branding massively. Yeah. Yep. I'm assuming. And even, like you say, even more so now as well with SEO and stuff like that. It, it's, I guess it's just constantly evolving. Yeah, well, it's accelerating so quickly. I remember when a couple of designers I used to, young designers working for me, they went, oh, we, we ought to be thinking about doing a website and getting onto email. I was going, it's a passing fad. Yeah. And, of course, generation, the first generation of websites were like brochure sites, really. They were fairly simple. But the real revolution for branding, I think, on, online is, is Web.2, is when the social platforms started appearing, the Facebooks and things. Yeah. And so suddenly people were having conversations with their peers about brands. So brands thought they had a good reputation. If they did something wrong, they would suddenly get a very bad reputation very quickly. So what happens, it's a bit like the, the storytelling around campfires is now spreading worldwide really quickly. Yeah. What used to be told in days is now told in seconds. So... The social platforms are a big revolution. Of course, we're just about to go into Web 3.0 and the metaverse and all of that and what that means. So that's going to change again, and how people operate with that and how people design for brands within that is going to change. But but the fundamentals, so like from you, with your, you you've seen the, the evolution of it and the different <coughs> changes and the different things, but from a... You, you sit down and talk with a client now, it's the fundamentals of getting the, the answer to the, what they what their brand is about still back to the, the I basics. I think so. It's still back to the basics because, you know, I, 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 my, you've probably heard this before, is, is I say a brand is like a, a fingerprint for a human or a tree ring for a tree. We've all got them, but they're all slightly different depending about what we're about. It's the same basic rules. hasn't changed with technology. You've still got to have, you know, why you're here, who you're here for, what do you deliver, how do they receive it, how do they react to it, what's the response you want. It's, it was the same when you were sending packaged goods around the world as it is now when you're selling services online. Yeah. So the, the fundamental rules haven't changed. The technology has changed. Yeah, okay. And it's a sort of – and, and I, I apply the same questions to every brand, whether it's a telecoms brand, it's a tequila brand, it's a, somebody launching a personal brand. You still ask the same questions, which are it's, – it's quite interesting. And, of course, the most difficult thing that a person has when they're trying to describe their company – and it's the funniest things I've ever had is when you say one of my questions is, what's your elevator pitch? Mm. You know, you've got 30 seconds or 100 words to describe what you do. And if you send those questions out to, I don't know, four or five different stakeholders in the company, and you get the answers back. It'll be completely different from the finance director as from the sales director, depending on which silo they're in 
And so what you've got to do if, to get the brand together, particularly if you're doing a brand refresh, is say, okay, we've got to get a consensus on what this means. Because you're talking, about, if you're talking about the company in a different way, you don't have a brand elevator pitch. You don't have a, something that the brand stands for. Because every brand needs to have a kind of mission and values and mm-hmm. purpose, really. Oh, that's really interesting. Look, uh, and I, I, I'm completely bought into I know like you and the guys at Inside Stories talking yep. and, and, and there's so much crossover with obviously yeah. w- w- what you do but that, that was for me we done when we done the Inside Stories process yeah. them, just finding what our narrative was yeah. it was the it was that penny drop moment game changer for us in yep. the sense that we did there were all of us sitting around the table mm. investors you know other directors and, and staff members and we all sitting there and actually if you asked each one of us we'd describe county business clubs in a different way yeah probably all come around to the same way of thinking and oh this is this and but we do x y and z yeah and actually we weren't all necessarily on the same page and i think that's that that penny drop moment of going actually this is our elevator pitch and we all agreed with it and all was yeah. like this is actually what we do yeah. was, uh, well you kind of you know if you think about it i mean one of my loves i, I kind of i was a designer you know i went to Kelly portobello and I, then i had a company called planet which we then sold to future brand i was creative director of future brand before i went independent but all through that journey i've been picking up different ways in which i, I want to do things and i moved very quickly from wanting to be a designer as to being wanting to create better brand strategy because a better brand strategy means you're creating a better brief for designers and copywriters. Mm. So the brand workshops that I now run now are purely about making sure there's a better brief because designers and copywriters, people on the creative side, hate having a brief that's like trying to be everything to everyone. Mm. You've got to have some focus. You've got to have some, sh- you've got to have a, you know, you, you should be hitting the target with a sniper's rifle, not a blunderbuss, you know? Yeah, no, I so, t- and even when it comes to sort of networking and stuff, you speak to people about, yeah. you know, and I, I've been so guilty of it as well when people say to you, oh, well, who's your, who, who, who's your clients? Like, who do you work with? Yeah. Oh, anyone. Yep. Can work well. can't necessarily work yeah. with everyone can you so what <coughs> the more specific you are and i think yeah. the more, the, and by having that brand yeah. identity by having that story narrative by being able to articulate that and communicate yeah. that in a better way you're able to then hone in on who are your audience who are you trying it's, to speak it's to? a great question people say to me you, you must specialize in something and of course i haven't i've worked internationally on lots of different brands big mm. brands small brands smes startups all across different you know, areas of, and categories and technologies and mm. products and services. And, and there's nothing I particularly love, but there are certain brands I wouldn't work for. You know, I, I don't really want to do anything to do with the military, for instance, or yeah. uh, environmentally bad companies, or uh, you know, I'm not particularly into sort of banking or lawyers, unless you're watching this and you're a banker and a lawyer who's doing <laughs> brand refresh. But, but there's kind of certain things which just aren't me. Yeah, you know, yeah. I tend to work better with uh, human brands, brands who I think are, are, tr- are striving for a purpose. They're trying to do better products mm-hmm. and contribute back to society and the environment in a better way. It's interesting. So, uh, I want to I touch on personal branding, because I know uh, we sort of yeah. spoke briefly about, about it offline. and, and st- it's t- it, is it is that something that's always been around personal branding? Mm. Like is, for me, it seems more like it's become more of a, but with, with you know with influencers and uh, yeah you know, social media and stuff, it, it's become more of a oh yeah. you build your personal brand. Yeah. And, but I, I think you're right. I think the difference is people are now aware that they can create their own personal brand. Mm. I think a lot of strong personal brands were created just by you know. Henry Ford or Marilyn Monroe or Charlie Chaplin, they were, you know, became famous for certain things and stood for things. Mm. Uh, one of the first people that really kind of, uh, I think, whether you like him or not, it's, it's not the point, it's Richard Branson and Virgin. Mm. You know, he definitely broke the mold by being saying, you know, here's an airline, but I'm entrepreneurial and, you know, you've got to buy into me and it's character. And I know I was a Virgin loyalist. I flew when I was doing lots of meetings in America yeah, yeah. with Virgin because I thought they were just cooler than 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 flying BA but also the thing is it wasn't just cool because Branson was entrepreneurial they had really clever things like they'd pick you up and take you to the airport in a chauffeur driven car Mm. even if you weren't flying business they had all sorts of services which were about we just want to make the journey you know from end to end Mm. just comfortable you get a massage on the plane I mean it was just much more just completely different from BA so that's where his personal brand I think has infused the Virgin brand and I think a lot of people now have begun to realise that that success, Steve Jobs with Apple as well, mm. um, in terms of you know a lot of the Apple success is about his philosophy. Um, but they've still built. I'd be interested to touch on that because they've still built like Virgin. He built a, an amazing brand, yeah. Virgin. But you're 
I, I guess what you're saying is actually that's all of anything that's to, under the Virgin banner is all synonymous with Richard Branson. People, people's mindset do they go the second they think of Virgin, do they think of Richard Branson? Is it that? I it? don't know. I think I think if if anything, I think the the Virgin brand is tarnished because you know if people are having a bad experience on a Virgin train, you know, or you know, and he's tried lots of things like Virgin colas and Virgin vodkas and things which yeah. have failed. So he's not always successful. But somehow, but, but to move on to other people who've begun to realise that they, you know, their brand has real value, and of course the archetypal brand that knows is Beckham. You yeah. know, Beckham has said, you know. Whether he's had good advice or a strong wife, or whether he's seriously bright himself, yeah. questions in the house there. Uh, but uh, you know, he's he just knows he's a powerful personal brand. Whether he's representing football, or whether he's representing a whiskey, or whether you know he and his family are launching perfumes. You know, they are definitely of of now in terms of Beckham. And I'm sure Beckham's kids will do much the same. You know, they're creating a dynasty. But he, but he has created that from. From being a sporting icon, isn't he? So yeah. He, he's, he, yeah. He's leveraged that sport, I guess. Not from a lame, so someone that's not a celebrity, not in that public yeah. eye, I guess. Is, is it possible for them to achieve? Yeah. I mean, I think the people, sort of weirdly, the people who I think have done really well at personal branding are a lot of the motivational speakers who obviously have written good books, uh, some of the people working in the healthcare profession, mm. you know, the well-being professionals. So I think there's there are a lot of people who begin to realize that it's that if they are both uh, out on a public stage, but they're also creating motivating publications, mm. that actually their brand, they represent something, you know, and that's where personal branding has really become more and more sophisticated, I think. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, personal branding, I mean, I've worked on David Bailey camera accessories and Alan Titchmarsh gardening tools, and uh, I've worked on Trini and Susanna um, underwear. You know, so I've worked on lots of sort of brands that are based yeah. on personality. But I think personal about personal branding about you know, I I've got something to tell you. I've got knowledge. And I want to share it, and I want to share it in a good way, whether it's the written word or or yeah. you know how I appear on stage. I think it's really important. So under that guise, I guess w would someone like, and I'll, well, I'd be keen to see who you think of when you come to that but for me you mentioned that I would be looking at people like Stephen Bartlett I guess yep. you know Jay Shetty those type of people yeah. exactly like you say yeah. they, they've created a, all right, they've become successful especially Stephen Bartlett become yeah. successful by selling a company and making some money out of it yeah. but what he's done is leverage his personal brand yeah I think there's lots of people. I mean, in my world, in the branding world, Simon Simek did the same. Yeah, yeah. You know, when when he wrote the why, you know, yeah, yeah. and he said, you know, all these old kind of brand keys and brand squares and all that kind of stuff. It's not. You go back to basics. You know, why, how, who, for, yeah. when. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. just the simple questions. And so you speak to somebody, say, have you have you read Simon Simek's the why? They went, yeah. You know, it's like you're all in the know. Yeah, yeah. So his brand, in terms of his expertise about actually the way he's he's reconsidered how we consider marketing and branding has is, is become, you know, it's so, he, very he's, successful. Yeah, he's fantastic. I've, I've obviously read it and, yeah. like, and so many people. Like, you speak to anyone about business, yeah. marketing, whatever that looks. Have you had Simon Sinek's <laughs> time? Right? You're, you're, you're absolutely spot on. I, I wanted to touch on a little bit, actually, about mm. your your personal journey and I guess, you know, what led you to start your own business yeah. for... and and. And talk to me a little bit about that, starting that, and you know some of the ups and downs of running that. I guess over the, yeah. uh, over the time. Well, in a way, I've I've had you know it's been a roller coaster. Some things I've chosen to do have been successful. Some have been failure. But you learn from the failures as well. Mm. Um, the first I didn't you know probably left a bit late. The first company I became a director of, a partner of, with a group of other people was uh, in, when I was thirty. Whereas now I think I should have done that earlier. But uh, at 30, it was the right why, time. Why, why, why did you think you should have done it earlier? Um, I think I, I still had lots to learn. You know, I was working in a really good agency uh, by that time. Um, it was Kelly uh, um, Porter Bell, you know, a really good agency. Mm -hmm. But um, I met some product designers, and they wanted to create new products from a three-dimensional point of view. And I was interested in more the two-dimensional. But, of course, if you think about the boom in new product development, certainly in the drinks market, mm. we did loads of drinks brands, which is great fun to re research, yeah, as yeah. you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so obviously, it'd be, if you think about how iconic the Coca-Cola bottle shape is, yeah. but we were creating bottle shapes and doing brands, and, you know, it was just, that was really when I really loved creating new products. And it, for all sorts of, our clients were uh, United Distillers and Guinness and Budweiser and Heineken, and, and people just wanted new brands and new brand shapes. 
And that, I found that really exciting. So that was uh, uh, a success. The stupidest thing we did is we kind of believed our own success and wanted to pay off mortgages. So we sold that company. And we sold it to a company who, I don't know if there's any legal people watching. I'm not going to say anything about them. We shouldn't have sold. We should have carried on independently. And so that was probably a, a mistake, kind of waking up and realizing a year later, I'm now an employee again. Yeah. It's quite a difficult thing to do. And the company we sold it to became Future Brand, and I worked for Future Brand for a while. And then I realized, you know, you kind of wake up in the morning and you've got a huge creative team. You've got to go out and earn tens of thousands of pounds of revenue every month just to feed the fire. Yeah. And I kind of, I think I had a woke up one morning on a beach in Caribbean and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I can, you know, I think a lot of my clients just want my experience. They don't need me to have a, a team behind. So that's when I went first independent. Um, and lots of clients came with me because they said, well, we want your advice and you know lots of very good creative people who can deliver it. So that's when I first kind of realized that um, you don't need to own a company when you've got the experience to uh, almost be like a hub and spoke network. The yeah. person wants to speak to you about your experience and then you can bring in those talented people when you need them. And of course, that's become the culture of now. I'm not going to say I predicted it. There are other yeah. people practicing it. But I kind of realized in my early 40s that having a building and filling it full of staff is not the smartest way to move. And also, I found myself that my biggest love, a bit like you, is talking to clients about what they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. My big love wasn't managing people anymore. You know, when you're kind of doing, you know, 30 appraisals of staff, believe you me, you feel, <laughs> yeah. you feel like a school teacher, you know. Yeah. It's not it's not as much fun as what you really want to be doing, which is the talking to a client about what are you trying to achieve with your business. So if I know more about your business, if I know more about your target customers, you know, then I can think about this is where I should be looking about molding your business and your brand. So I've been really doing that on and off in different guises um, for the last 20 years and moved to Brighton 10 years ago. And, of course, what I found in Brighton, one, I wanted to kind of semi-retire anyway, which I've not managed to do very well. <laughs> but also, Brighton kind of revitalized me because it's such a great community here. It's a great technology and creative hub. And there's lots of freelancers who want to work together. The collaboration here in Brighton is fantastic. And, you know, I made, you know, as you know, yeah. you collaborate with loads of people. And I'm not going to say I predicted it, uh, but I do think I predicted lockdown in terms of working from home five years before COVID. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's so, branding and technology has changed, but also how you deliver. And as, as you get kind of experience and stuff, I, I then became a non-executive director for a company who I really love, who I'm still very close with, uh, called Studio Blup. Uh, I've had a relationship with them for about 10 years. And they were acquired by the lab group uh, in Soho uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. They were acquired by a great company, and they're now the creative driving force mm. and uh, you know it's it's I first saw them saw some of the website work they were doing some of the illustration work mm. and I thought to myself this is the future of design and how they were playing and of course they're now doing NFTs they're doing holograms they're doing mixed reality <coughs> you know they, they've applied their creativity for branding through mm. technology and just I don't have to do that because I it's still me saying well this is the brand framework just mm. fill it with the stuff you need I love that. I love that. Like you've mentioned that to me a few times about brand framework, and <clears throat> like you said, that what's really interesting listening to the the whole journey and the history of brand and stuff. That just like you you've alluded to, coming back to those you yeah. know, those ba those fundamental basics yep. is always going to be at the core of it. And then yep. you know, of course, you've got to develop and you've got to adapt to you know World Wide Web and AI and all them things that that come along it, but. Mm core and are still in fundamentals. The, the one thing that I've really loved about doing my work, particularly in Brighton and particularly working here with people at Plus X, is how the young entrepreneurs, particularly the solopreneurs, are so committed to giving something back. They're, they're committed to community, society, sustainability, the environment, in a way that the, my generation probably wasn't. And I think that I love the fact that that's driving it. And almost every business I'm working with is striving to, to, to be a B Corps. Yeah. You know, and and almost have that stamp of actually we we have proved we're contributing something back, and that certainly wasn't my generation. You know, we didn't strive to be a B Corps; it didn't exist. You know, it's not it wasn't the same sort of thing. But um, I, I think that because that's being woven into business now, you know, people are not just saying I want to provide a good service or a good product, mm. but I want to people to know 
that I've sourced it ethically, I've manufactured it ethically, uh, you know, and brands like Patagonia led the way, of course, in that, in terms of, you know, brands with purpose. And uh, it's, it's interesting how society and the environment, and particularly young concerns about how society is changing and how the environment is changing, has made, I think, bigger businesses have to rethink what they're doing. In fact, I know it has. That's really t- touching on that point about people wanting to have a bit more of an impact. The, uh, one of the things I wear the T-shirt now, like one of the yep. things I, I constantly ask is people's definition of success. Yep. Do, you, do you think that ultimately in business, and that has been since the beginning of the time, I guess, yep. that it's measured by your financial profits and that's a successful business based on that. Do, do you think that that, that has shifted it's a really tough question. I mean, you know, I, I, I built and sold businesses and made money which paid off houses and mm. sun through education and stuff like that. I now don't think it was the be all and end all and it's not what I strive for now. And it's not Did what that I, drive you when you, was, when you started that business and you got into that stage? To I, I don't know whether it drove me or I was driven by the success of it. In other words, you know, I was working at a time when branding was really kind of, uh, the sort of mid nineties to now, branding has just changed. You know, when I left art school, you could go and work in corporate identity design or packaging design. Nobody talked about branding. They're exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And branding is an ethos. And there were great books, ones that I've I've loved. Um, One of them was called The Big Idea. And in fact, I called one of my companies The Big Idea because I just thought, you know, it's exactly what Simon Simic saying at the heart of a successful brand has to be a big idea. Mm-hmm. If there's not something, and, and it's still true now, you know, if you can't tell a compelling story and it's not based in truth, you're either not interesting or you'll be found out and then you've killed your brand. So there's a kind of responsibility which is now n- kind of knitted or woven into what brands have to do, mm-hmm. which probably wasn't true many years ago. That's interesting, but but do do you think then your defi- like you said you, you may be driven by the success of the business that had grown and then uh, but then but for you now do you look at things co- differently for that measure of success? Do you, someone mentioned to me mm. not that many, but someone had spoke about it. Someone I know really well and she, about actually a, a business wouldn't it be brilliant if businesses were measured on their emotional profit as opposed yeah. to. I, I, that's not really an area I go into, but I do get a reward now. You know, the reward I used to get before is, is you know, delivering a successful new product that suddenly took the market by storm was, you know, fantastic. Now, particularly as I work with a lot of startup brands and SMEs and solopreneurs, I say, you know, just seeing them be successful on their journey, there's something about now, I guess it's the brand that age of giving yeah. something back, yeah. you know, and seeing so uh, almost the cathartic seeing it through their success mm-hmm. is, is, you know, so I'm sure I'm sure I probably wouldn't like myself at 40. I was probably more driven by yeah status, finance, all that kind of stuff. Mm. It's not you know you, I don't know. They, they say that you just become more I don't know calmer or empathetic or whatever. But is it, but do, do do you think that that actually society it, it, there's a there's a shift around that narrative around because I, I'm like I say I I, I question because I'm conflicted in. Yeah. within me sometimes because I, I what I think I really truly believe mm. is the you know success is w- w- what we're here for to love and be loved and that's yeah. my you know mm. I've really bought into that the whole yeah. Charlie Mackesy type yeah. book and that message and I'm trying yeah. but then there's, there is the flip side that the ambitious side that I don't see myself as successful because I've never yeah. been financially successful yeah. so I look at it and go other people maybe look and go oh, you know, yeah. he's not made money, no. so it that that therefore doesn't define a it's, level of success. It's a great question, um, but you know, if I'd wanted to make money, I wouldn't have gone into design. You know, you mm. know, the same as you know, I say to my music friends, you know, it's a hit and miss thing. Mm. You know, if you'd have gone into banking or something, I don't know. But it's it's kind of that money is wasn't the driver. The fact that I managed to make a success of a business that was actually proved to be more and more profitable was, you know, partly luck, partly serendipity, partly timing. You mm. know. Um, and of course, you enjoy the status of the house, the car, and all that kind of stuff. But I think it shouldn't be a driver now. I think if you are good at what you do, you will become successful. Rather than saying, "I want to be successful, so I'll be bullish about it." I don't. I think there's been a shift in terms of I, I'll make my own luck, 
and I'll also be consistent. You know, I know that we've talked about Ikigai before, but that's mm. quite an important thing for me now. You know, every brand I think should have its Ikigai. Ik- ikigai. Every person should should understand their Ikigai. You know, because I'm doing now at brand that age what I love, mm. uh, but I, when I was 21, I was doing what I loved. Mm. All it's all that's happened is I've changed. As society has changed, as the economy has changed, mm. as technology has changed, y- you just surf that wave. Okay, I just wanted to say something about one of our sponsors, Creative Pod. It all starts with an idea, the kind of creativity that wins hearts, changes minds, and drives new behaviours. Creative Pod is an award-winning, full-service marketing agency that work with their clients to become their outsourced creative department for a fixed monthly fee. For almost 20 years, they've been offering clients a full-service approach in everything from branding, PR and social media, to web development, pay-per-click, and print advertising. They've been County Business Club's outsourced marketing agency for over a year now and have been a real game changer for us as a company. To find out more, get in touch with the team at www.creativepod.uk.com. Okay, back to the podcast. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it because I really want to talk about Ikigai and Mm. some of the listeners might have not heard of it. Just explain what that is what that means and what it, I guess what it means to you. Is yeah, it? well, I use it in my, my, my uh, brand workshops, but I use it a lot for personal branding in particular, mm. is, is, you know, it's a, a Japanese philosophy, which essentially means the thing that motivates you to get up every day, the thing that motivates you to get out of bed in the morning. And to find your true ikigai, you've got to kind of, you know, what are you good at? So imagine a Venn diagram. That's the Venn in the middle. What are you good at? You know, what do you love? Uh, what's the world need? And what can be rewarded for? If you get all those in harmony, that's your ikigai in the middle, and that should be your personal brand purpose. So, you know, for me, I knew I was good at creativity and, and problem solving. You know, I loved art and design. You know, I was working on brands that wanted clever, creative solutions, and you can get rewarded for. And it's still that th- is true now, but in a different way. So, um, if you apply that to any brand, you can get to, and it's one. It's only one of the tools. There are lots of different tools. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, but it's 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 a very simple tool. And I did that for somebody who actually I'm doing some personal branding for at the moment, mm. and I'm also doing some mentoring at Soho House. I've just done a Nikki guy for her. She went, I've never heard of it. She's 21. She said, I love it. I said, Are you going to tell all your friends? She went, Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. That's brilliant. I, I, I find it fascinating because it is. It's, it's, and again, it's asking. And sometimes they're difficult questions to yeah. actually ask yourself, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. And, and the same. I think the same with branding as well. Like back to them, them questions from a business point of view. Sometimes they have them really difficult questions yeah. that you have to ask. To, yeah. But if if you don't find the answers to them, you're never going to yeah. find. Them but I think solution. you know. You know. We'll talk over a, over a coffee or a pint about your Ica guy. You know, I, I've seen what you've been doing, and a lot of it's about your empathy. It's about the fact you love people, you love conversations, you love communication. There's all there's certain things about you which you know. I know you've come from a different background, through different kinds of businesses, but you've kind of you're, you. It seems to me people is at the heart of your yeah, you know absolutely. your Ica guy, and, and, and getting people together and getting people to talk, which yeah. you know that's a good thing. As we were talking about the sort of mental health and stuff people need to talk about that yeah. more and uh, getting business people to talk and share I think is great. It's one of the things I love about the, the business club is getting people all completely different professions just talking about the joy of being in business and the joy of their own particular business it's yeah. you know oh, it's, it, oh, I completely agree with you it's a magical part of it uh, something I've found fascinating being in and only found that route really be, being being in business, I guess, yeah. for so long, and, and building community, and not actually realizing that that was part of what I love doing. But yeah. being around people, I'm definitely a people person. I always have been. Yeah. I, lo- I love that. And I, but actually, you're right. learning over the over the last ten, fifteen years of running business, especially being in this amazing yeah. business community here. Yeah. Like, it, my, I've always said on here with county business clubs, my only, not not so much fear, but my thought process of as we grow and we go yeah. oh, okay we're going to go to Kent or Surrey or yeah. you know Essex wherever we we expand to next is that how unique is the Sussex business community here mm. it, just because I've embraced it and I've been fortunate enough to meet amazing people here and yeah. I, I wonder how unique it is here well it's a great question I've been working on the plus x brand mm. on the brand strategy side of that and of course uh, they uh, the choice of Brighton to do the very first Plus X before they expand nationally um, 
has been a brilliant choice because it's it's been able they've been able to test mm. what works and what doesn't work, but probably test it in a way that you know there is a unique quality to to this culture in here, mm. uh, in this city and and, and on this coast. Um, and I think uh, they've been able to prove to themselves that the model works. Mm. Uh, so it's a good testing ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I agree. I agree. And then, well, look, t- t- tell me a little bit about you know, what's well, some massive brands that you, as you sort of alluded to there. But what, in in your opinion, give give me some, I guess, some key elements that you think really make a yeah. Well, make a, make a well, brand. it's you know, it's J- Jeff Bezos who knows a few things about branding. <laughs> yeah. he's the one who said you know, a, a brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And of course, what he's saying is it's true. Brand is about reputation. It's not about what you tell them. It's about what they say about you. So you may think you're telling somebody, but if they're not listening or they're not hearing it properly and they're reinterpreting it, you haven't got a brand. So it's a lot of brand, a good brand is about obviously a great product and service. It's about promising and delivering against that promise and service. Having a purpose, I think, that people understand you for, although I don't believe that all brands have to deliberately have a purpose. There's a lot of purpose washing going on. We'll come on to that if you want. Mm. But um, then also about delivering against your promise. Every single touch point, you know, when you receive a package, when you go into a store, every touch point, when you go online, it's kind of, you feel, oh, that brand has a kind of harmony about it. Mm. It's not disjointed. And so the clever thing is, and I say this when we're doing a brand refresh or a brand design, it's no good just thinking that you're communicating to your consumers. Your employees have to believe this too. If they are not your disciples, if they're not carrying on your ethos, the whole thing back to the elevator pitch, if they're confused about what your brand is, you don't have a brand. Because if, you know, they've got to be proud to work for the company, they're going to be your best advocates, you know, it's like, you know, you want them to wear the T-shirt. Yeah. Um, and how does that lead, I guess, how, how does that lead into culture? Like, do, do you, like, from a branding point of view, mm. Does, does that infiltrate the, um, and decide what the company culture is going to be? Once you, if you spoke yeah. to a startup and you go, right, yeah. from from this from this starting point now, you get this brand identity right. Yeah. That's gonna that will live and breathe your culture moving forward. Yeah, well, some companies the chemistry is built on the founder, you know, the Steve Jobs kind of philosophy, yeah, yeah. or the Richard Branson, and some are about actually creating something which is much more like a community or collaborative culture. You know, and which isn't such a personal brand. It's actually just a, here's something we here's an ethos we share together. Mm. Um, but you've got to have one. You've got to have a mission. You've mm. got to have a set of values, because if you don't, how can you communicate them? And, and also, every brand has a different. Like individuals, we have a different personality. And a lot of you know, I was once joking to my son. I said, I'm a fashion designer for capitalism. And he went, What do you mean? I said, Well, I'm dressing businesses. What I do is I dress the veneer about what it looks. Like. And he went, Oh yeah. <laughs> and <it's, laughs> my dad's a fashion designer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't quite mean that, but it's so, you know, in the same way that we dress in different ways, which says something about us. Mm. A lot of the visual side of branding and the story, you know, so we all have our own tone of voice, but we dress, you know, so you remember people by, and I say to, a bit like, I hate the term digital marketing or, or, or social media marketing, because the same trick was true before technology. You know, if you want to grab attention, you walk into the middle of a room, you have to say something interesting and people want to listen to you. Otherwise, you're going to be a wallflower and be in the corner. It's the same thing online. You know, if you want to grab attention, say something good, say something interesting, say something entertaining, but make sure you're saying something that's valid and true. Mm. Otherwise, people will just, you know, you'll become space junk. Yeah, you know. I love that. I love that. Me- meaningful, memorable, or moving. They're, yeah. They're, they're, yeah. They're, 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 hey, you're a brand out. man. It's the four M's. That's the, that's the, that's the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nick that from Inside Story, Gareth. I remember, I remember that sitting <laughs> on that thing and then mentioning that, and I was like, yeah. that is, and that, that's true, isn't it? Whatever yeah. you do, I think you, it's yeah. so Yeah. Well, it's, it's not the five P's of marketing. It's the four M's of, yeah. of, of humanity. But yeah, because yeah, I think that you know we forget that you know brands like countries, like religions, like money, they're all constructs. We've made them, and humanity have made them up. Yeah. Sure. But so, but we so we're in control about how they happen, or sometimes we're not in control. Yeah. Cool. So, we're saying about obviously the future. Now that you obviously we're, we're at time of recording. This is just after we, you delivered the a great um, a great presentation at obviously the BBBC about, yeah. about AI and and talk to me about that. Talk about the future. What does yeah. that? Because AI has just been yeah. my chat GPT has yeah. been mind blowing. Delving into that from a from a copywriting point of view, but. It was brilliant, your, your yeah. presentation, because from a visual point of view, it was just fascinating to learn. Yeah, well, it's, it, I mean, 
AI is really, you know, and I want to, you know, branding and design are two different things. You know, obviously I went in through design. And uh, what I mean by that is, is I'm working my way through AI and how it's applying to design. And obviously it was following from a great uh, talk that James gave about copy. And if I was a copywriter, I'd be more more scared of text generation than as a designer. Mm. And there's all sorts of issues about intellectual property, what you can actually publish anyway. Mm. And of course, there's lots of tools coming online now about actually finding out that this has been borrowed or stolen from mm, something. Yeah. So I think there's going to kind of be AI wars going on. But you can't ignore the the, the, the cat's out of the bag. You know, yeah. it's Pandora's box has been opened now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you don't learn how to use the tools, you're going to get left behind. You know, in the same way I tell students, and, and this blows their mind, I say, you know, I do a, a kind of, uh, here's me, I, I want you, help you on your brand journey. Here's my brand journey, you know. Da, da, da. I left college, I got my first Apple Mac when I was 27. And again, like, how did you used to design then? I used to draw and had felt pens and <laughs> had paper. And they're going, what, you used to draw packaging? I went, yep. <laughs> wow. You know, and so they, they can't get their head around what would happen. And, and of course, I remember when the first Apple Macs came out, the first computers, designers were running scared and going, oh, it's going to kill our profession. And of course, it's not. AI is not going to kill a profession. Just like, you know, photography didn't kill fine art. Yeah, yeah. The synthesizer didn't kill music. What it did, artists saw photography, then invented new forms of art which couldn't be photographed. Yeah. You know, mu musicians created new forms of music that didn't come out of four guitars. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it's some of the dance music I love is because of the invention of the synthesizer and craft work, of course. You know. yeah. <laughs> but, um, so I think it's early days. My, the point was, I was trying to say I'm having fun with it. And, mm. and I, I use it more for research more than anything. And if you think about it, if you were researching something before you're using AI image generation, you'd just go on the internet and do some screenshots of different things. You'd go onto Pinterest or Instagram or into image libraries and, and just gather mood boards together. Well, the fact you can now type it in and it's done for you means it saves a lot of research time so I can spend more time on actually then developing the creative idea. I, use, I think if it's used as a research tool, it's fine. Mm. Because of all the legal issues around, which is early days, I'm still playing with it. To be yeah, fair, yeah, it's yeah. just, you know, the cat is, I'd say, out of the bag. But I'm having so much fun with it. And it kind of just makes you almost, it accidentally creates things by accident mm. that actually, that's a nice visual accident. I can use that. You know, I'm sure musicians with synthesizers found, oh, you know, when you listen to one of my favorite tracks of all time, you know, uh, Blue Monday by New Order, they talk about some of the accidents that happened when they first unwrapped their first, you know, started playing their, their synthesizers and went, whoa, this drum machine thing. That's kind of, yeah, <laughs> you know. And Pete Hook would play his bass to it and says, oh, it sounds like a track. But, but the point is, it, it creates new things. And I, I'm a music fanatic, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went into de design mainly to pay for a big vinyl record collection. <laughs> and I, I used to do DJing and stuff like that. So, um, so I think the analogy between mixing, you know, t sampling and stuff, and how to use AI in the same way, if you just, you, you know, as, as James said, if you just get some raw AI copy, it'll be very accurate but quite dull. But yeah. if you take that copy to inspire you to then write a better story, a better piece of narrative, but it's actually helped reference some words you need, you know, it's just, I think, if you use it as a quick way to research at the moment, yeah. um, but I, I, I can see these tools are going to change very quickly. And I, and that's it, and I, but I think the same with anything in life, whatever you learn over your course of your journey that you go, actually, it's just about adapting and pivoting and look, COVID was a perfect example of that, wasn't yeah. it? You go, we was forced to pivot and yep. think differently and yep. innovate and come up with new ideas. We was forced yeah. to do that. Yeah. We was forced to work from home. We were forced to change the landscape of how business operates, I guess. Wasn't Absolutely. It? So yeah. um, didn't mean that then actually there's not going to be people in offices and buildings yeah. and and everyone's going to work from home now and we're never mm. going to do that because actually there's some value right back to the feeling that we sort of mentioned about people being people mm. that people need to be around like yeah. I, cra I, I crave human interaction like, I agree I, when I worked from home one of the reasons I come to plus x and become a member quite early on was because I worked from home yeah and I was behind a screen all day and yeah. I just it, it drove me mad and yeah. like, and I'd work from home for 
10 or 15 years yeah. prior to that but I was always out and about at events but you couldn't do that so yeah. when I just come in here and then creating a space where there was a community and you could just bounce some ideas off yeah. or just bump into someone at the coffee machine yeah. and have a chat yeah. there's something so powerful in that and that I don't no matter how like robotics and AI and whatever comes along they're great aids and I think if you embrace them then amazing what, what you can be achieved I couldn't, couldn't agree more you know we were all locked up and having to do zoom calls and all that kind of stuff the minute the kind of you know shutters were lifted people said oh, I can't wait to go back and meet people again mm. but actually what made people say is this a meeting where we need to meet in person or is this a meeting we can do in 20 minutes in zoom so it forced people to say we don't actually need to get on a train and do that meeting if it's just a short decision the three of us can make you know yeah, however if we want to have a longer session we need to brainstorm ideas it's easier to do it in person it's easy to do you know with a pen and paper yeah. whatever tools you've got I, I think you know I, I ran some zoom workshops and they were okay but there just wasn't the same energy, creative spark. There wasn't the same electricity in the room of when, you know, you know when somebody says something and you say to somebody there's no wrong answer in a, a workshop and somebody says something really stupid and you go, actually, there's something really clever in that. And yeah. I just think that because with the Zoom thing where you click on and off, not everyone's, you know, whereas collectively you kind of work in a different way. So I think that, I think, I love the fact we've now got a mixed economy. You know, I'm sure that, and, and I know that, you know, from agents, friends of mine in London, the ability to say, you don't have to come in the office every day. Come in and for the meetings you have to. Come in when we need to have a collective conversation and, and you know, divide your time up. So I think there's going to be, you know, if I was a commercial property developer, I'd be running scared. But I think for um, uh, businesses, I think they're just adapting to ways of working. Yeah, I, com I completely agree. And I think, especially from the creative part, I remember I was speaking to a friend of mine who works in sort of PR and um, Flow Power, and she, she was saying, like, from a creative point of view, like, we are much better when all the whole 10 of us in the yeah. team where many they are now all around the table and bouncing on especially from a design branding creative absolutely like the, the etiquette on yeah. zoom is not quite the same is it you go oh do i speak that, now or not yeah. It's all, but that, yeah exactly yeah. you can't just like just want to you almost want to over talk so oh no no but what about this and then like, oh yeah and that sparks another idea yeah. and that's, yeah. that 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 creativity is yeah. it only comes for me i agree i mean i used to you know love having teams of designers because you always saw that one on one makes three yeah. but actually both with good ideas but actually if we join that together that's mm -hmm. an even you know so and I still think that's true now is that um, there are some very good lone wolf people who can do it all themselves but I always think teamwork and creativity just means that even if there was the, the, the lone wolf had the great original idea just bounce off people to see if it can be you know you can get 10% better out of it you know you can modify it you know you can you know just polish it into a better diamond I completely agree with that. I, don't, I think, you know, I, I think it's really difficult to to, to go out on your own and go up oh, because no matter what you do, no. you're always going to need someone. Yep. You're always going to need other people to help and support you on that journey, whether yep. you're the focal point or not. It doesn't happen if you haven't got yep. a team of people around you, whatever that looks like. I agree, and you know, some of the, the, the solopreneurs I work with, you know, when we're talking about the ideas, I say, you know, I think you've come up with a really good idea, but why? You don't have to pay for any research. Just ask family and friends. Just bounce it around them. See what they think. You know, at the weekend, just because I, I think you're right. Uh, you think you're right. Let's just double check mm -hmm. and sometimes they come back and go actually I had a really good challenge so we all need to be challenged because if you go around thinking you've got the best ideas I'm sure some people out there that's not the way I, th I think the world works I think uh, you know particularly if you're designing things for yeah. people it's you've got to have some degree of consensus and some degree of of just checking yeah yeah, yeah. otherwise you end up with uh, brands which really should never have been launched like yeah. did nobody when they were launching V, VW this was, yeah. say that actually calling a car a Sharon is not the greatest idea. <laughs> so they're fine in Germany. They launched the VW Sharon here. And they, somebody, why didn't somebody say, I just don't think that's the best name for a car. <laughs> <laughs> love that. love that. Well, um, Sorry, Sharon's around sorry. the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I want... I really, this is something I'd be really interested to find out. I wrote this question down. I really wanted to ask it. If you... From a branding point of view, if you could work with any brand in the world, past and present, who mm. would it be and why? Yeah. Uh, to be fair, because um, my mind was blown when I got my first Apple, and, and I was really a very early adopter. You know, in my in my brand ad pitch, I mm. say that I've got decades of experience, but I'm young of young at heart. 
I was a very early adopter of, of just thinking this is changing everything. Because I remember going out to stay with my brother in California. My brother yeah. was a, a, a computer nerd. He, yeah. he, he was, you know, he thought apples were, were nothing because he loved doing programming and stuff. You know, I wasn't into programming, I was into creativity. Yeah. But even his kids were designing Christmas cards on his computer, you know. And I went, I've got a design team back in London working on major brands who haven't got a computer amongst them. So when we got the first Apple, so it, and, and seeing how Apple have evolved and grown as a brand, and, and Johnny Ive, who was the product designer behind some of the great uh, Apple innovations, to have worked in Apple during that time, I, you know, and particularly in that part of California. Yeah. So yeah, but the pr brand weirdly I'd love to have worked with, I used to go past its office in Hammersmith, was Island Records. Oh, really? You know, because I'm a massive music collector, and particularly big reggae fan. Yeah. And Chris Blackwell, uh, who's Jamaican, uh, formed Island Records, and of course he launched the careers of Bob Marley and people. But it wasn't just the music they were doing, and they had some great artists on their roster. Mm -hmm. But the album design stuff was was fantastic. I remember one of my favourite albums is is uh, Bob Marley's Catch a Fire, and it's a bit like Blue Monday's New Order by Blue Monday. It's got one of the most expensive covers. It looks like a Zippo lighter. So you open it up and you pull the record out. And I think they now you can't. They're as rare as hen's teeth. Yeah. But I just thought somebody was smoking a large one to create that. Yeah, it's just yeah. So I think the culture and you know both the music they were presenting and the design work they were doing it was it was great. Yeah, it's it's incredible, isn't it, Apple? And it's just it, I, and it, I guess it's partly you know we're both members of Soho House. I, yeah. I, I think part of the membership you have to have a Mac. Is that right? Like to, yeah. <laughs> to get past <laughs> the door. Yeah, <laughs> everywhere you look around. But it's so strange, isn't it? That we something so iconic like, yeah. like what they created well I, th I think what what's brilliant is, is going back to and steve jobs is a bit of a hit and the great thing about apple is it's such a great story and you know people go where does the name apple come from and he was obsessed by uh, uh isaac newton mm. and of course the the story apple falling on isaac yeah, Newton yeah. invents gravity that's where the apple name comes from the very first logo for apple was terrible it was a picture of isaac newton sitting under a tree it's so bad right uh, if, you, uh, yeah, if I show you, you'll laugh. Yeah. Uh, but also, the other thing that uh, Isaac Newton was a pioneer in was uh, also uh, colour theory mm -hmm. about uh, managing to understand how light worked through prisms. He was a, a leading physicist. So, the combination of, of colour and gravity and light, he was a seriously, it was genius, technical genius. And that was, that was, if you like, that was Steve Jobs' hero, which is why one of the failed products that Apple launched was called the Newton. And, and one of the logos uh, in Apple's growth was a, a sort of multicolored rainbow based on the colors of the prism. Mm. Um, but where Apple started, the ethos of saying, we're going to make a comp comp computer that is about what people do with it. It's not about the machine inside the computer. You know, Bill Gates can tell you all about the, the RAM and the megahertz and mm. stuff I'm not interested in, how to program it. I'm not interested. But if I can create beautiful pictures or beautiful music, so that whole thing about think different was, yeah. about, was actually jumping into the, what the consumer wants, not talking about the machine. And for somebody who wasn't interested in programming computers, it was like, this is for me. Yeah. It's not me someone's, he knows who I am. You know, I think a lot of people, a lot of creative people around the world thought that and still think it. And I think that, and like, I guess, bringing it back and alluding to what we're talking about, that is the, that is the key to a, a, a brilliant brand, isn't it? That yeah. you actually, yeah. ha how does that make it? That made you feel like I'm part of this. That yeah. they're speaking to me, yeah. and that. And, and then there are other, other examples. I mean, you know, um, uh, Studio Blob did a lot of work on Nike, and Nike is a great brand because again they had this thing where they went, um, you know, it's not about you don't have to have to be a professional runner. You know, yeah. it's not just about our shoes. It's it's we believe there's the inner athlete in everyone. Yeah. You, you see some people even sports direct, you'd question it. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, the whole thing about just do it is about just be yourself. Yeah. So the best brands jump, make the jump into what motivates the consumer. It's not about the physical parts of it. Of course, everyone, you know, you know that's why BMW is the ultimate driving machine. Mm. You don't have to know how to fix a car. You know, yeah. it's the experience. And there's so many brands who've who've made that leap into going motivate the consumers and uh, you know I still think it's true now yeah. think about what the person Jeff Bezos what the person you're selling to is saying about you yeah. because they are your best best disciples you know if you piss them off excuse my French but if you anger them and they realize that you're hollow or shallow yeah. or shoddy they then in the same way you can grow a reputation you can kill a reputation because yeah. like social media then will bombard you Amazing. Oh, mate, fascinating. Now look, uh, tell me, what, what what does the future hold for Brand Dad? 
Uh, unfortunately, not too many more years. But I'm, <laughs> I'm okay with that. Now, the thing is, I, I, I came here to sort of semi-retire, done bits and pieces of consultancy, bits and pieces of lecturing, loving running brand workshops, Love the fact I've been rebranded. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't use brand ad everywhere. I'm Bill Walsgrove, when it, um, for more professional. Uh, uh, but brand ad seems to. I love the fact that people go, "Oh, you're like an experienced bloke or an older bloke who's worked on brands." So that's me. Mm. Um, so in the future, I just want to carry. On. I don't think I'm. You know, I just. I don't like golf, so I don't think I know how to retire. Mm-hmm. I don't like the clothes, the check trousers, or anything. So I'm always going to do a bit of lecturing or a bit of consultancy or a bit of advice whilst I'm fit and able to. So. And, you know, I love Brighton, you know, it's kind of um, everything about it. You know, yeah. I, I love walking by the sea. I love walking on the downs. There's something about it back to, I hate to say it, I went back to London at the weekend, had a great time back in my old stamping, stomping ground in Camden. But there's something about the sea and the air. I don't know, as, yeah, along with the people, it's just, you know. It's a magical it, place. It, yeah, and I love, you know, I love my time in London. It wasn't where I grew up, but I love my time there. Um, and, you know, so I, I think, you know, the zeitgeist for me or the timing for me or my ikigai is, is what I do and the way I work seems to s- suit Brighton businesses. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm somet- I say to them sometimes, I'm the board you can't afford. You only need me for one day. Yeah. You know, you don't need to employ me for three years. If, if you want a serious objective analysis yeah. of what's good and wrong about your brand, I will give you the honest opinion. If you don't agree with me, Fine, I'm not going to. I'm not going to make it up for you because yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't got an, an agenda to sell the services like I used to do. Yeah. Not saying I used to lie, but when you're trying to sell the services of quite a, a big agency, you don't try and piss the client off by telling them something they don't want to hear. Yeah, yeah, Whereas sure, sure. an independent, you can be a bit more honest and say, "I don't think this is working." Yeah. And the lovely thing about AI, I've been using this recently. I had a client recently, and they wanted to do this brand name. I said, "Well, that brand." sums up these images to me I don't think it's right and she went really I said yeah I just uh, don't think it's right so I programmed the words into uh, mid journey my image generator yeah. and all the images I was talking about came up and she went okay I said that's not just me talking mm-hmm. you've just scraped a hundred million images off the internet which had just agreed with me you know I said <laughs> a- a- AI research one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that and it- one thing I'd, I'd be just interested to just touch on there, like where you are right now, mm-hmm. like we said about a few, you can tell how passionate you are about yeah. it. Every time I meet you, you've got enthusiasm yeah. and you you love talking about branding yeah. and it's been a fascinating conversation listening to mm-hmm. it and stuff like that. But where, where you are right now, go back to when you was running the company with many staff and stuff like that. What, how, how do they compare? Both, I'm sure, Both great experiences. Yeah. But w- would you be... M- if I had to say, give me a definitive answer right now, yeah. would you say your ikigai is more where you are right now? Or yeah, my ikigai has been built, has, has always been leading here. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly, when you're trying to run a company as it grows, you're obviously aware of your own brand. So, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of my learning about how brands should communicate was built building, yeah. but also a lot of financial responsibility and a lot of personal responsibility mm-hmm. in a way which I'm not, you know, I'm not encumbered by that anymore. Mm-hmm. So I've got the freedom of actually being, you know, quite literally, uh, I can still talk about brands in the same way I have been passionately, but, but I'm, I'm not fettered, I'm not chained. I'm, I can just say, I, you know, mate, you've got a good brand, I get it, or mate, in your workshop, your five colleagues have all said something completely different. I yeah. don't think you've got a brand, but we can build it together, but you, you've got to get some sort of consensus. So the combination of... of the experience of having gone through, you know, growing commercial companies and then being a kind of independent yeah. um, uh, has allowed me to use that, that all that experience objectively. Yeah, love that. So yeah, probably it's a good question. Yeah, it's it's I, I've found a, a funny old route to make it, guy. Yeah, yeah. But but I think if you plan for it, I mean, that's the you know I say to people, well, you know. Sometimes you can't take the first thing you want to do. Mm. You you get there through different. And I know, knowing your journey, yeah. you you find your way, and it's kind of I think water finds its course. Yeah. You know, and I say to the students, you know, when there's a kind of group of thirty design students, I say, whatever you think you're going to do now, you won't be doing in thirty years' time, because yeah. the world would have changed. And sometimes you'll get lucky, and sometimes you'll meet the right person, yeah. and sometimes you won't. It's you know, it's it's. 
you know, it's but you've just got to the, the things you've got to do to be a successful design student is to uh, keep your natural curiosity, your natural passion mm -hmm. for creativity. Always ask the question why or the question why not, and then think about how can I do something better. So it's and I kind of because you know I didn't know I've got designers I've worked with some who are now work running mobile phone game companies, mm -hmm. some who are doing uh, titles for the BBC. We all did the same course, yeah. but we all went off in different directions. And you know, much as I love what he's doing with TV graphics, and much as I love what he's doing with mobile games, brands is really. If, if I'm, I'm quite, quite passionate about actually, when you see a company do well, and when you see them refresh what they're doing, yeah. do their branding, and, and make people reappraise them, there's something about that. Uh, it, it's not the most important thing in the world. I'm not a doctor, yeah, I'm not yeah. a brain surgeon. But I do think I help businesses. If I can help businesses be more successful at what they're trying to do, that, that has some sort of uh, feedback to me. Amazing. Amazing. Mate, what, what a fascinating conversation. It's been brilliant. Uh, and so many takeaways. And I guess the listeners, from a brand point of view, there'd be so much that they can yeah. and, and, and encourage people to obviously reach out to you, mate. But uh, as always, we're going to finish off with our quick fire questions, if I can. So you I'll can chuck, do whatever I'll, you want. I'll no. chuck these at you. Yeah. So one piece of advice do you give to your 18-year-old self? Start a business earlier. Network more. Yeah. Go out to meetings and stuff. Get a dog earlier. Be a bit wiser on who you marry. <laughs> uh, and buy more lottery tickets. <laughs> I don't know. No, it's definitely, I would have started, should have started a business earlier. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to it because I, I, I often think, I think, and I, I say to people about we were entrepreneurship, it wasn't encouraged necessarily when no. I was at school. No. So coming out of that, I think, would I have, if it had have been like it is now, mm. a little bit more, and it is a bit more of a buzzword or whatever, would I have gone, this is actually who I am, I, I yeah. would have found that out early yeah. and I would have started a business at 16. But would I, and, and would that have been the right thing to do? Because do you think potentially the right time was through the experiences and stuff you had got you to that place where you started? Well, it's, it is a good question because I've got several friends whose kids have started businesses, a lot of them forced to because of lo lockdown, mm -hmm. And part of me has gone, I think, they, and they've had some success and some failure. And I say, I think if they'd have gone to work for a bigger company and learnt a bit more about the industry, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have gone down that route because it's very easy now to think, oh, I can just, I can create my own website in Wix. Mm -hmm. I can sell it all on TikTok. And, of course, lots of kids do did that during lockdown, fine. Suddenly when the shops are open, they wonder where their businesses have gone. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was about timing. But, so I do think there is some that if I'm, you know, I'm a bit old school, I definitely feel that two of the businesses I worked in taught me a lot. They were my kind of university of life. Yeah, and they yeah. taught me about client relationships, uh, made me learn, learn a lot more about marketing and marketing mm -hmm. strategy because a lot of people I worked with were natural marketeers. Mm -hmm. They come from the marketing side of business, whereas I come from the creative side. And I do think the great branding is, a, is is the combination of two skills. It's left and right brain. It's yeah. the, the creative and the analysis. It's the it's the market and the left field thinking. It's mm. it's the two. It's a marriage of those two things. Yeah. So I think that having watched that and, and sort of learned that by by through my colleagues, I definitely made me probably more focused. It's made yeah. me better. And I can you know you can almost see it when you're kind of working for a client. You go uh oh, and you kind of sometimes have to sort of particularly your lead client, but if you're being employed by the owner, you have to say, I don't think your person there gets it, or you know, yeah. they need some retraining or something, because they're, they're banging the wrong drum. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they go, like, well, I said, I know, because I've managed people, you know. Yeah. So I'm not just giving them advice about the brand and business, but sometimes about the way in which their business is being done. Yeah. And again, I can say it honestly, because it's, I'm not a stakeholder. In yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Okay. Um, Who's been the biggest inspiration throughout your life and why? Uh, that's, yeah. Well, I was so lucky to have so many good um, art tutors at college. Um, because it's, I, I, I tell you, I think probably the thing that really got me connected into, yeah, probably motivated me to go to art school, so right at the start, is not only did I love comics, but some of the artists that I really love were using comics in their art. So Andy Warhol mm. and Peter Blake, particularly the English pop artist who did the Sgt. Pepper's cover. Yeah. And uh, 
so the fact that they were combining creative art, in other words, the, the, the creativity they were doing for their own self, their own self brief, they weren't yeah. doing it for commercial reasons, but it was using kind of things like Campbell's soup cans or mm. in Peter Blake's term using, you know, the roundel from the RAF or they were taking things from common cult, popular culture yeah. and creating them as to art and I just I found that really motivating I think a whole generation of designers I grew up with um, found that and I was really lucky um, and this is you know I love this because I was uh, living in Chiswick at the time and uh, uh, my son was on a roundabout in a park and there was this older bloke with a beard mm. and with a, a young girl on the roundabout and you know it was a sunny day and you see you go how long are they going to be on the roundabout for? Yeah, when, yeah. When's the pub open? All that kind of stuff. And uh, I went, and uh, this long white beard realised it was Peter Blake. Wow. The artist. And uh, I went, uh, excuse me, Peter, you know, well done, mate. She's quite young. She said, it's my granddaughter. It's my granddaughter. You know, <laughs> don't, don't forget. And so my son, his granddaughter, were playing. And uh, I said, Peter, can I, you know, I, I'm a massive fan. You know, I'd love to come and talk to you about your life and come see your studio. He said, yeah. Gave me his phone number, wow. went round. He showed me his studio, lovely big house in Chiswick. Um, lovely man. He talked about his love of pop culture and pop art, and had all these wonderful things in his studio. And then I was working six months later for the Save the Children Fund. It's probably one of my favourite projects, actually, mm. uh, amongst many. But uh, and I and we came up with this idea of. Um, getting 12 artists to do 12 pieces of work, mm. each which would be for a month, for a calendar, because we'd sell the calendar for Save the Children and auction the art pieces. So this is before the internet, of course. And um, I said, well, I know Peter Blake. I'll ask him if he'll do the front cover. And <laughs> people in the studio went, he's going to ask Peter Blake. It's never going to happen. Brought Peter Blake in a week later, Brilliant. and he designed the, <laughs> designed the front cover. We won an award for it as well. Wow. And so, to some of your heroes to be, you know, yeah. it was, you know, quite something. I've had, I've got music heroes as well who, yeah. who I've met. Um, oh, so, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. But, but great, so very inspirational, and also, you know, still working to this day. Yeah, um, yeah pop art, and and, and 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 much as I, you know, I think there's a lot of strange sides to Andy Warhol. The fact that you know his whole factory and. You know the Velvet Underground and the culture, not just around the art, but around music and fashion. Mm. And of course, you know, the factory then influenced obviously Manchester and New Order and Joy Division, all that kind of yeah. stuff. So that whole that whole link between pop art and pop culture, and all of my favourite musicians, weirdly enough, went to art school. David Bowie, Brian Ferry from Roxy Music, Eno. You know, there's, there's something about art and music which has definitely been influenced me. Pop yeah. culture. Awesome. Love that story, Peter Blake. <laughs> Peter Blake. It, was, it was just, <laughs> it was like, you know, it's kind of, yeah. You might hear it. Oh, I've got to tell you the other one yeah. uh, from Music One. So I was once on this plane flying from Atlanta to New York, and uh, I got upgraded to first class, pretty good, on the champagne. And this really big lady with big sunglasses came in, and all the air was just, oh, great to see you back, man. Great to see you. She sat down next to me, and I kind of went, Are you Gladys Knight? And she went, I sure am, honey. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, I didn't know what to do. I went, because I'm a massive Motown fan. Yeah. So I went, can I talk to you for the flight? She said, yeah, let's get the drinks in. I and, she, and she was just great company. But I had another mate of mine who was at the back of the plane on, and hadn't been upgraded. And when we met by the carousel, she said, uh, how was your flight? I said, I sat next to Gladys Knight. She was great. He said, you just make it up. And Gladys Knight was with her entourage and said, see you, Bill. Have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Love so, it. you know, a bit of hero worship. Mate, awesome. Love a story. I love a story. <laughs> well, um, could you recommend a book or a podcast to our listeners that has had an impact on you? Unfortunately, James beat me to it because Sapiens, the book he was talking about when you yeah. did interview, is such a great book about humankind. But I, I've kind of, I used to love reading crime fiction, all that kind of stuff. But the books I tend to read now are much more about people and humanity and history. Mm. Uh, and the book, I'm, in fact, I'm going to get you to read it is uh, awesome. How to Be Animal, which is by a great writer called Melanie Challenger. Okay. And I've recommended this to several people. And it's a great, st you have to read the book because when you, it, she just says this thing, which is amazing. She says, you know, you open the book and she says that the most successful creature on the planet, the most successful animal on the planet is a human. And they deny being an animal. They deny all the sensibilities and the psychology and the, the physical aspects of being an animal, wow. about fears. And so she's talking about, you know, how to be animal, how to learn actually a lot of our instincts. So you're going to read that and I hope yeah, you like I'll, it. I'll, thank you very much.
I love it. Thank you. Which well, a nice, the love thing thing about that, it's a bit like, you know, Sapiens is all about humankind. Yeah. And this is about a different aspect of humankind. Yeah. And there are several other books I'm reading now which aren't so much psychology. They're much more about sociology and about yeah. how people link with your, your interests as well, how people connect to each other, yeah. what motivates us, what drives us, what, what, you know, what in the way we, in nature and nurture, yeah, sure. made us be the way we are. Love it. Mate, I'm on that. Thank you. Final one to wrap up. Oh, God. One rule for living a fulfilled life. Uh, one rule. Don't worry, be happy. Just be yourself. Just be yourself. You know, just live your ikigai. You know, because I, I think all of us have to recognize we are Marmite. You're not going to please everyone all the time. Some people like you, some people don't. Don't get hung up about it. So I'd say just be yourself. Be true to yourself. As long as you're not obnoxious or rude or dangerous, you know, just if you think that's important and it doesn't hurt anyone else, just be yourself. Brilliant. Mate, what a great way to finish. This has been a fascinating conversation. I, lo I loved having you on, so thank you it's, so much. It's always such fun. I mean, yeah. the thing is, we could talk for ages. Could. This is just chapter one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, come back with chapter two. <laughs> we're in, we're in. Mate, that was great. And that, as they say, sir, is a wrap. Thank you. This is the County Business Talks podcast, produced by H2 Productions.